Halo, apa kabar Bapak Ibu dosen dan pengajar, teman-teman mahasiswa, teman-teman SMA, SMK, dan pelatihan dimanapun berada. Apa kabar hari ini? Semoga semuanya sehat dan bersemangat mengikuti program khusus ITS bertajuk Guest Lecture Series on Sustainable Development Goals atau SDGs. Saya Maria Anitya Sari, dosen teknik dan sistem industri ITS yang sejak tahun 2012 diberikan amanah menjadi Direktur Kemitraan Global ITS atau ITS Global Engagement. Izinkan saya memberikan sedikit pengantar mengapa kegiatan hari ini dilaksanakan. Saya akan berbagi PowerPoint saya dengan Bapak Ibu dan teman-teman sekalian dan saya berharap apa yang akan saya sampaikan bisa memberikan gambaran tentang apa yang sedang terjadi di seluruh dunia pada saat ini. Baik, hari ini kita akan memasuki Guest Lecture Series GLS on Sustainable Development Goals atau SDGs. Dalam bahasa Indonesia-nya disebut seri kuliah tamu tentang tujuan pembangunan berkelanjutan. Apa sebenarnya pembangunan berkelanjutan? Mengapa kegiatan ini perlu? Mari kita lihat sama-sama beberapa data berikut. Gambar-gambar ini menunjukkan tren perkembangan kondisi sosial ekonomi dunia dari tahun 1750 sampai dengan 2010. Izinkan saya memperbesar gambar ini sehingga kita bisa melihat dengan lebih jelas. Kita bisa melihat di sini bahwa pertumbuhan jumlah penduduk sangat tinggi. Bahkan setelah tahun 1950, pertumbuhannya sangat eksponensial. Kita bisa lihat tidak hanya pertambahan jumlah penduduk, tapi kita bisa melihat penggunaan energi juga meningkat dengan sangat tajam. Bagaimana dengan penggunaan pupuk, fertilizer? Bagaimana dengan penggunaan air? Bagaimana dengan produksi kertas? Kita bisa melihat di dalam gambar-gambar ini bahwa peningkatan penggunaan resources atau sumber daya luar biasa besar dari tahun ke tahun, terutama mulai tahun 1950. Hal ini tentu saja berdampak pada situasi dunia. Mari kita lihat gambar yang berikutnya. Tren perkembangan kondisi lingkungan dunia. Dalam kurun waktu yang sama, kita akan lihat per... meningkat tajam. Tidak hanya itu, kita bisa melihat peningkatan suhu bumi. Kemudian kita bisa melihat ocean acidification atau peningkatan kadar asam di lautan. Bapak, Ibu, teman-teman mahasiswa, siswa SMA, SMK, maupun kursus pelatihan, kita perlu tahu bahwa apa yang kita lihat di dalam gambar ini seringkali disebut sebagai greenhouse gases. Dan inilah yang menyebabkan terjadinya global warming, pemanasan global, dan menyebabkan climate change atau perubahan iklim. Climate change ditandai dengan curah hujan yang sangat tinggi. Kita lihat saat ini kalau hujan luar biasa dan juga kekeringan yang sangat panjang pada musim kering. Semua ini mau tidak mau harus kita sikapi. Karena kalau kita lihat di dalam gambar berikutnya, Indonesia sebagai negara yang sangat besar, Indonesia sebagai negara yang sangat kaya, jumlah penduduknya sangat banyak, betul-betul menghadapi tantangan yang luar biasa. Kita lihat sampah merupakan problem yang dari waktu ke waktu tidak kunjung tuntas untuk diselesaikan. Dan semua itu tentu saja di-trigger, disebabkan karena pertumbuhan jumlah penduduk yang sangat tinggi. Sampah plastik secara khusus, kita lihat di dalam gambar kedua. Indonesia merupakan penyumbang sampah plastik terbesar kedua di dunia. Dan kita tahu bahwa plastik tidak... Isu mikroplastik, plastik dalam besaran-besaran yang sangat kecil, yang kemudian ditelan oleh 
ikan masuk dalam rantai makanan dan kemudian masuk juga ke tubuh kita menjadikan problem kesehatan yang sangat amat berbahaya. Tidak hanya itu, kita lihat kebakaran hutan, baik itu karena kekeringan yang sangat panjang ataupun karena kesengajaan membakar hutan untuk tujuan pembukaan lahan dan seterusnya menjadi problem yang sangat luar biasa. Di mana-mana tempat, jalan mulai macet lagi setelah pandemi dua tahun, polusi udara sangat membahayakan. Kekeringan kita bisa lihat di berbagai tempat. Kontras di tempat yang lain banyak. Hujan banjir pada saat musim kemarau kering kelantan sehingga harus berlomba dan berburu air bersih di mana-mana tempat. Dan yang paling dekat dengan kita air-air ini, kita melihat tren bencana yang dari waktu ke waktu semakin meningkat. Dan tidak hanya frekuensinya, tetapi juga severity-nya, dampaknya, keparahannya semakin meningkat. Karena itu, Bapak, Ibu, dan teman-teman semuanya, United Nations, PBB, Perserikatan Bangsa-Bangsa, memberikan warning yang sangat serius. Mulai tahun 1987, sudah ada pertemuan tingkat tinggi di PBB untuk mendefinisikan bagaimana pembangunan itu harus dilakukan secara berkelanjutan. Kita harus meningkatkan pembangunan di seluruh dunia, di setiap daerah. Tapi pembangunan yang semena-mena akan mengakibatkan dampak lingkungan yang sangat besar. Karenanya di tahun 1987 diberikan satu definisi tentang sustainable development atau pembangunan berkelanjutan. Di, di dalam slide ini kita bisa melihat pembangunan berkelanjutan adalah pembangunan yang bertujuan untuk memenuhi kebutuhan kita saat ini. Kita butuh transportasi, kita butuh bangunan, kita butuh makanan yang memadai, kita butuh pakaian yang cukup, kita butuh teknologi komunikasi. Tapi semua pembangunan itu tidak boleh mengorbankan kemampuan dari generasi mendatang, future generation, untuk bisa memenuhi kebutuhan mereka sendiri di kemudian hari. Sehingga kalau kita melakukan pembangunan, mengambil resources, mengambil minyak, mengambil besi, mengambil nikel, semua kita manfaatkan habis-habisan, maka tidak ada yang tersisa untuk generasi masa depan. Mereka tidak akan mampu untuk bisa memenuhi kebutuhan mereka seperti kita memenuhi kebutuhan kita. Pada saat didefinisikan di tahun 1987, orang mulai terbuka bahwa ekonomi tidak bisa dijadikan sebagai satu-satunya tujuan. Lingkungan harus diperhatikan. Dan tidak hanya ekonomi dan lingkungan yang menyatu dalam satu mata uang dua sisi, kita juga perlu memperhatikan faktor sosial. Yang disebut kemudian tiga serangga ini, ekonomi, lingkungan, dan sosial, menjadi satu serangga yang disebut dengan triple bottom line. Triple bottom line. Namun, belum ada guidance yang cukup jelas apa yang harus dilakukan oleh masyarakat dunia, apa yang harus dilakukan oleh masing-masing negara, masing-masing daerah, masing-masing perusahaan, masing-masing institusi, masyarakat, apa yang harus dilakukan untuk mewujudkan pembangunan berkelanjutan. Karena itu, di tahun 2015, PBB mendeklarasikan Sustainable Development Goals atau dalam bahasa Indonesia nya tujuan pembangunan berkelanjutan. Kalau kita ingin dunia kita menjadi dunia yang baik, harmoni, tertata, maka kita harus memperhatikan 17 aspek di dalam Sustainable Development Goals. Kemiskinan harus betul-betul dikurangi, dijadikan sebagai sejarah. Kemiskinan membuat banyak orang kemudian memanfaatkan resources secara berlebihan. Karena itu, no poverty, tiada kemiskinan harus merupakan tujuan. Kemudian kelaparan. Jangan sampai problem kelaparan terjadi karena itu berarti kita tidak memperhatikan keadilan sosial. Kemudian yang berikutnya, tujuan yang ketiga, kehidupan sehat dan sejahtera. Pendidikan yang berkualitas, gender perlu ada kesetaraan. 
tidak lagi ada pembeda antara laki-laki dan perempuan di dalam menikmati pendidikan misalnya. Karena ketika perempuan diabaikan, menjadi sangat berisiko. Karena ibu yang tidak cerdas, ibu yang tidak memahami kehidupan yang kompleks ini tidak akan bisa mengajarkan anak-anaknya bagaimana menghadapi kehidupan yang kompleks dengan bijaksana. Kemudian, edukasi yang keenam, clean water and sanitation, air bersih dan sanitasi layak, energi bersih dan terjangkau, pekerjaan yang layak dan pertumbuhan ekonomi yang baik, stabil, dan kemudian inovasi industri. Kita juga harus cara untuk merejus inequality. Artinya, kita berusaha untuk mengurangi ketidakseimbangan. yang berkelanjutan dan sehat, konsumsi dan produksi yang bertanggung jawab, penanganan perubahan iklim, ekosistem lautan, ekosistem daratan, dan juga perdamaian dan keadilan. Dan semua itu bisa dilakukan kalau kita melakukan kemitraan. Bersama-sama, tidak hanya institusi dengan institusi, tapi juga negara dengan negara, kita perlu bermitra untuk mencapai tujuan. Hari ini, kami ingin menyampaikan bahwa ITS adalah institusi pendidikan yang sangat berkomitmen terhadap SDGs. Hal ini dibuktikan pada tahun 2021, ITS dipilih menjadi institusi dengan impact ranking tertinggi di Indonesia. Artinya pengakuan dunia bahwa ITS memiliki kepedulian terhadap Sustainable Development Goals atau tujuan pembangunan berkelanjutan nomor satu di Indonesia dan nomor 64 di dunia. Karena itu, program hari ini merupakan bentuk ITS untuk terlibat dalam Education for Sustainable Development. Bapak-Ibu, teman-teman, baik SMA, SMK, pelatihan maupun mahasiswa, development Sustainable di dunia bergerak untuk melakukan education for sustainable development. Tahun 2020, ketika dunia dihantam oleh pandemi COVID-19, semua orang panik dan berpikir mengapa ini terjadi. Kami menyadari bahwa ini terjadi salah satunya karena manusia tidak sadar, tidak paham tentang perlunya pembangunan berkelanjutan. Karena itu di tahun 2020 kami memulai kegiatan ini. Seri kuliah tamu dalam Sustainable Development Goals. Kita melihat di tahun 2020, 1.900 peserta dari 9 negara telah menikmati kuliah tamu dari 15 pembicara. Dan di tahun 2021, 6.500 peserta dari 24 negara mendengar materi dari 114 pembicara yang berasal dari 12 negara. Tahun ini, ITS kembali menyelenggarakan program yang dibagi menjadi dua bagian. Bagian pertama, Senin sampai Rabu, dan bagian kedua, Rabu sampai Jumat, dengan delapan pembicara, tujuh universitas dari empat negara, dan tujuh pembicara, enam universitas dari tiga negara. Di dalam slide berikut, kita bisa melihat negara-negara yang mengambil bagian di dalam seri kuliah tamu tahun ini. Terima kasih untuk semua pembicara yang dengan senang hati berbagi masing-masing poin dari SDGs. SDGs 1, 3, 4, dan seterusnya di bagian 1, dan kemudian SDGs 4, 6, 7, dan seterusnya di bagian yang kedua. Berikut adalah gambar dari pembicara. Kita perlu menyambut gembira karena ini adalah langkah yang luar biasa. ITS tidak berjalan sendiri. ITS melalui partnership mencoba untuk mengundang pembicara-pembicara dari luar untuk berbagi dengan teman-teman mahasiswa. Tapi kali ini, tahun ini, tidak hanya dengan mahasiswa, kami berbagi dengan siswa-siswa SMA, SMK, dan juga kursus pelatihan. Kami berharap program ini akan menjadi kesempatan belajar untuk semua. Mari kita belajar apa yang sedang terjadi di bumi kita 
Dan tidak hanya belajar, kita berubah untuk menjadikan dunia kita ini dunia yang lebih baik. Kiranya itu pengantar dari saya. Saya sangat berharap kita semua bisa belajar banyak dari pertemuan kita hari ini dan kita bisa menjadi orang-orang yang mengambil peranan merubah dunia. Salam! Man.
until the ah okay the, the, <laughs> but, but this is for this microphone no yeah. ah, okay ah, okay okay mm -hmm. so uh, then for the handwriting you can translate you have everyone has used google translate is program but it's learned from gavin texting bahasa and english for example and, it, and then it learned how to to translate from one to the other the speech to text you can speak and it will recognize what you are uh, saying you can type and it will generate a speech as well and many other things and, and also for example for self-customizing programs like amazon it will learn your behavior or youtube whatever you do it will actually uh, uh, learn and, and, and see what you're doing and try to predict what are your tastes and what uh, what things would be useful for you or at least to sell you for example in i have and it's it's incredible the amount of um of information this system have about us uh, i i had the, always the, uh, this example of a student i had he didn't want to put any information in the internet because he didn't want to be like targeted by marketing campaigns. And we, so at some point he was he was shown some products that he was actually interested. Search one how no his flatmate, the person he was sharing the, the house with, his friend had gone into the internet and actually bought some of these products. And the systems not only have information about what you do on the web, they have information about your personal life, where you live. And they it knew these two people live together and assumed that if they live together, they have something in common and suggested the, the items to buy. So, so this is everywhere in our lives. So then um, um, what is artificial intelligence then? One, one definition a uh, uh, long time ago, the, one of the earliest definitions is uh, artificial intelligence is the science of, of, of engineering of machines, intelligent machines. So the, 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 the this definition is a strength. You define artificial intelligence in terms of it is similar to to, uh, it's a similar problem. You, the artificial intelligence, you define, you define as, as building intelligent machines. What is an intelligent machine? So a long time ago, this was tried to tackle as a, a defining what is an intelligent machine. And then uh, it was um, someone called uh, Alan Turing proposed this, what is called the Turing test. What he proposed was that the human, there's a wall, a wall here, so these people cannot see the other side. This person cannot see what is on the other side. And there is a human that is interacting with two things. One is a computer, a pro computer program. You can think of chatting with like with WhatsApp. And then the, another human. But the person cannot tell which of these, who is chatting to. If after a while of interacting with the, the computer and the human, this interrogator human cannot tell then machines because it is simulating human intelligence so the, uh, this has been questioned this kind of test is called the turing test for a machine and there are contests some every year that people bring programs and there are 30 people 30 juries that will interact and if they are confused of who if it is a program or a person that will pass the Turing test. And I think three years ago, for the first time, a program passed the Turing test. So, so this is a kind of Turing test. And you can see in a very strict, restricted domain, uh, um, this is a good example to exemplify what, how artificial intelligence go, has gone a long way from 1996, IBM, the computer company, uh, produced a hardware and a software called Deep Blue that uh, play at chess in a really high level. So chess is considered to be an intelligent game. So they built a really specialized program to play chess in the most efficient way and more high level way. And they have a championship with at that time, champion was a Russian called Kasparov. So they have a championship. And in 1996, Kasparov beat, it, or beat the, the the computer, the program, Deep Blue. But then the IBM went back to a lab program or they have a, a, a team of researchers and they came back the next year, 1997. And in 1997, the, the, the computer beat Kaspar. So then they, they, it was for the first time a computer in some intelligent behavior 
has has uh, uh, beat uh, uh, a human, uh, a human expert because he was the world champion. And Casper asked for for a rematch. They say, okay, another championship. And IBM say, no, no, we close the close the project. They they didn't want to play anymore because they have won and then they, they retired. That was in 1997. Nowadays, the 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 best chess uh, program that you can use is called Alpha Zero. That is re is done by re by Google, and it was trained in only four hours. In four hours, they they uh, let the program play with itself. And then when it was winning, they gave rewards. And then when it was losing, it didn't get rewards. So in four hours, the computer went from playing as a child to playing as an expert, an unbeatable expert, and went through the whole history of chess in four hours with no programming. In 1997, they needed a team of 20 researchers, hardware and, and software researchers, and they had to build this, this really powerful chess uh, program. And now they, in nowadays, we have only, well, in four hours, it was learned on its own. So artificial intelligence has changed completely. The, 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 completely. the difference is that now, in the, if you went back to 1996, this system was programmed and was unable to learn on its own. The, the system was only repeating instructions that were programmed to, to, the, to, itself, to itself. But now the learning is a big important component of intelligence. And nowadays the systems now is called machine learning, which is a big field of artificial intelligence. Machine learning is capable of learning, making the computers learn on their own. You just give observations and the computer learn from experience, like Alpha Zero in four to play. Machine learning is the field of the study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So you just give data to the, to the computer and the computer learns on its own. So, so it will learn the program. You have to program to write the program yourself. So um, this for this is based on, uh, in, on something and it's called deduction. Deduction is what we all do. Deduction is if it is raining and I go out, I will get wet because we know that if we add on the rain, it, it will get wet. So we make these assumptions. If I will go out, I will get wet. And we deduce these kind of things. The second one is abduction, which is something that this is abduction, which is like Sherlock Holmes reason. They, they take, a, for example, if it, if it rains, the grass gets wet. You wake up in the morning, you see the grass wet, and you assume it has rained in the evening, in, during the night. But that's not the case, not always the case. Someone could have rains the garden. So, so then it's something which is probabilistic, but still uh, something that we all do in the li daily life. And then induction. Induction is machine is what machine learning is based on. Induction is a set of observations. Suppose you you go wake up the first day and you observe that it's windy and it's humid and uh, and it's raining. Second day you wake up and you observe it's, it's, it's sunny, it's windy and and it's raining and so on. So then if you see things that repeat every day, you see they might have a relationship. If you observe P, Q, and R, then P, Q, and S, T, and P, Q, and S, you start to think that P and Q have something to do because they always appear together. And that's kind of generalizing. Induction is, I give you an example of induction, and I ask you to do the induction for me. Suppose you go to a different planet. You arrive to a different planet, and you have different animals that look different to here. The first, the, the first the three here on top, they suppose there are cats in that, in that planet. There are the, these three cats. You, you work with someone that is from, from that planet, and it tells, well, look at this, this is a cat. Look at this, this is a cat. Look at this, this is a cat. And then you, you keep walking and say, this is a dog, this is a dog, this is a dog. So the two different animals, two different classes, one class of cats, one class of dogs. And then you have to tell me now, if, what is this, a cat or a dog? Any any ideas? So there's three are cats. the second. So this one should be a cat or a dog. A dog? Why? Who's a dog? Why? Why? Dog. And why? Why is that? Like, like this one, like, like that one, no? 
exactly. So you could, one good way would be could be a could be a, a dog lying down. It's just rotated. So so it's, the, it's one way is to say what is the sim most similar one, and then if it is similar to that one, should be similar to that one. But in general, we want to kind of another possibility will sim symmetry. The dogs are symmetrical. You, the, the symmetry, the axis of symmet symmetry here, symmetry and symmetry here, and this one and none of this one is symmetrical. This one is not symmetrical. None of those. So this one is symmetrical. Should be a dog. But on the other hand, anyone thinks a cat? A cat? Anyone suggest a cat? So the yeah. Well, no. Well, well another possibility would. corner and this is black black and black and white so then maybe the property is that if this is black is a cat and if this is white is a dog if we look at this one this is black so it should be a cat so so it could be a cat but the thing is we have only three uh, examples of each so if we had hundreds of them this will this ambiguate we will see which is of symmetry or it is rotation or it, what is the what is the the property that distinguishes them? So this is called induction. What you have done is taking some observations and extracting some property which is capturing the uh, the essence of the problem. And this is what we humans do. We do when we are babies. We learn to speak. Our parents speak to in our in in our language, and we listen some sentences, and we start to recognize sentences. We, we don't just memorize sentences, we start to create in our minds a grammar of our language. So once we have learned this kind of generalization, we can say any, we don't have to, we, have, we, can, we can say phrases we have never listened to. So then we kind of generalize what we, the, the observations, and then we make it bigger than, than the or generalization, more general than the observations we have made. So there are plenty of, of tasks. There are many tasks that we can do in inducti induction tasks. One, the classification is the one with the cats and dogs. We have two classes and we want to have some criteria to separate the two classes. We have some, for example, people with a disease and people healthy, and then uh, we, we have some information about the genes. So we want to put a boundary and say anything above will be, will be disease and everything below will be um, health. We have also regression problems, which we want to predict, for example, the price of a house, not, not a class, but a number. And then while we have this, this uh, each dot represents a house, we want to put a, a line or a, or, a, or a function that will be as close as possible. We have clustering. Clustering is when we have data and we don't have any labels and we want to make groupings that belong to each other. For example, in social networks, we have lots of people. We would like to probably make subsets of people, people that like sports, people that like uh, reading and so on. And then, and then we make subgroups of this one. And then we have, for example, ranking. When we use Google, we all get this ranking of hits. Have you ever wondered how Google ranks when we type some query to Google and we type enter, happens? Do you have, have you entered what happens? About this? No? Well, it is it, not many people wonder about that. We just use Google and we don't care. But uh, in the past, it was easy. When, when I was a student like you, I was studying computer science um, and mathematics. And then the, the what, what I, uh, I, I used to build web pages. It was the beginning of the internet. And the search engine at that time was, if you, for example, I put pet shop uh, Surabaya to find a pet shop in Surabaya, then it will look for pages that had a pet shop and Surabaya as many times as possible. The one that had most Surabaya pet shop, Surabaya pet shop times, that will be the first hit. The second one will be the second one of these, these keywords. But what we used to do is in very tiny letters, really tiny letters, pet shop, Surabaya, pet shop, Surabaya, pet shop, Surabaya, a lot of times, and put a picture of a dog, for example, on top. So no one saw the, 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 the words, and we, we came on top always, always because we have so many repetitions of these words that then we get the, the highest number. But that changed a lot since then, since then because of course this has money issues. The, 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 if you hit, if you are the first hit, 
and you have a business that re that relates to music, how, sorry, to to money, how much money you will to earn. So nowadays it's much more complicated. You have a web page, and it will be ranked um, according to how many web pages go into your web page. You have a link to your web page, and how important are these web pages as well by how many uh, links go to the web pages that go to your web page. So that's impossible to replicate because you will have to build thousands of web pages pointing pointing at each other. So, so anyway, uh, uh, I, I think, well, I, I speak a bit about uh, what is the general thing we do in machine learning. We have some data sets. We have some group of observations, like for example, the cats and dogs pictures. We apply some algorithm that will learn the patterns, but we don't program the algorithm. Normally you just apply the algorithm. We obtain something called a model or like a function that will be predicting what we are going to uh, extracting, for example, the grammar of the language. And once we have that, we can start making predictions with the model. So that's machine learning. Um, I think that was a very rough introduction, but it has been, it's a really powerful mechanism right now to do machine learning because it can do many things. Going, for example, to um, um, uh, the, the graphic design students, I was talking yesterday to them, uh, how a model that you take text, you say, for example, a dog with a hat in the moon, and they, the algorithm can actually learn and draw the picture for you. you, you or you have give the picture and it will you the text, the caption of the text. So it is really impressive what you can do nowadays with machine learning. It's, it's really impressive. I, I don't know if uh, I can, I, I can I can expand, but maybe I will talk about the second topic, which is music. Let's talk about music. Music, as you know, is a human trait. Every culture in the world has has music. There, there is no culture in the in, in our world that has no music. For example, here you have yours, the gamelan. The gamelan has the traditional Indonesian music. So everyone has music. It's a it's a human trait. Second observation is that music is good for us in general. We all listen to music. To, to be happy or to get sad or to or to bring back bring back memories to modulate our emotions we all have this like we like music and it produces some emotional reaction so it's good for you for us and for emotions and the third one of the third observation is that music is even more powerful for ourselves is more useful if we play it if we actually make the music that will bring us benefits in many ways there, there have been many studies in which they they study people that play music and people that don't play music and they compare the differences and how they, they, they this has a, a a benefit for example i don't know if you have seen the the brain in pictures but the and like that because it's just two sides that are completely connections in the on the bottom which is called the corpus callosum and this is the way they communicate both both hemispheres of the brain people that play music for a long time like musicians they have this corpus callosum which gets thicker in the brain the most the more you use a part of the brain the more it gets connected and the more it gets robust it's like highways of communications more roads in, in that area because when you play an instrument, for example, the guitar, you are coordinating movement of one side from the other side. So the two hemispheres are communicated all the time. So by using this bridge, it gets thicker. And this has advantages in other, in other fields. If you want to integrate information from different kind of functionalities of your brain, if you have this link, this bridge is like stronger, it will actually make it better. It will be more efficient. So people, Playing music has been, for example, you have uh, improved attentional networks. You you have paying attention better in a better way. You have uh, 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 motor brain regions enlarged because you are all the time moving. So that this, in order to move, then the regions get more uh, connected. You have better auditory memory. So on. even a study that showed that children play instruments, the IQ, the, uh, uh, the kind of intelligence test a score goes uh, uh, higher. So there are many, many benefits. So the question is how now, how can we use music and artificial intelligence to promote SDGs or how or to help in SDGs or 
or how to promote uh, uh, advance or, or, or health and well-being in this case. So we have done this in, in our group in different ways, in, in, in our research group. One is making music playing accessible to everyone, to, to even people that don't have any uh, motor control, that they have some dis disability, motor disability. And also we build models to predict what is the best possible therapy for someone before the medicine is taken. So, so we do that. So making playing, I will talk about the first one first, uh, uh, making music playing accessible to everyone. What happens is that we have, I mentioned the musical benefits. We have these musical benefits. With, without motor disabilities, then you have a musical instrument that fits our hands. The piano, the guitar are perfect for us have a person with motor disabilities, this connection is broken and the person cannot play a traditional instrument and, the, and they cannot access these musical benefits. So what we do is to build this kind of interface, the bridge between the person and the, and the, and the musical instrument, taking the best capacities the person has and then map and then use that to trigger musical notes or music in general. And through this, through this interface, they can reach the musical benefits. So, as I, of course, when I talk about motor disabilities, there are many kinds of motor disabilities. Someone could not be able to move a finger and someone could not be able to move any, any part of the body. So it's a big spectrum of possible disabilities. So just to tackle these in steps, one is motor disability in which you can still control somehow parts of your body. Second one is when you cannot control any part of your body, but you can control your eyes, where you look at. And the last one is very extreme, where you cannot control anything. Your brain is intact, but you cannot move anything from your body. So in the first one, motor disability, with partial motor disability, what we do in our group is we have someone with a motor disability, and then we want to, we test all kinds of sensors. Maybe you are, you, are used, you are familiar with sensors in instrumentation. We have distance sensors. We have, well, eye trackers. We have the potentiometers that are variable depending on, on, on light and things like that. They try all of them to see what are the sensors best capture the, the eyes of that person. And then once we have that with a prototype, like for case, uh, this was a person who wanted to play the guitar. He had cerebral palsy, he couldn't play. Direction, left to right. He couldn't control movement uh, up, uh, up, uh, forward and backwards, and he couldn't control either up and down. He could just control one side, and he could move the, uh, one finger as well. So uh, what we thought is maybe we design something that captures this movement like that, and then the, this round the bit here can be used for strumming. He can select the chords, of the guitar and a strum to the to the people to this person in particular, and then we just ask them to do some learning. When we when they learn, <clears throat> uh, they uh, we try to see learn. We the learning curve is exactly the same. The only difference is the timing, tempo. For them, it's very difficult because they have never walked. People that have never walked have never spoken in their life. Then rhythm for us is very to walk, and we have this walking rhythm. But if you have never walked, or when we speak, these are rhythm, or when we speak, these kind of phrases. But if we have no, someone has never done that, then this is a more uh, difficult concept to grasp. But we have developed some tools to to try to make them um, uh, master timing as well. So I, I show you a video. So this is the. the, the uh, the video is really good because he's playing the, the sound of piano and the and the tutor is also playing the piano so you cannot hear what he's well. selecting the chord but interestingly what happens with, with, with Ralph is he uh, only moved one hand he couldn't he had never used the other one for anything and when when he started playing music as you see his right hand would have more accuracy than like here, he's, he's reinforcing without anyone asking him to use the other hand, he starts to automatically use the other hand. Why this happens is because also in the brain, we have when sound comes into our ears, it goes to the auditory cortex, which is this part of in, the, in the cortex, in the brain. And this part 
is connected, very much connected with the motor cortex, which is just here. There's a, a part of the brain that is in charge of controlling and making movement. There's a lot of connections between the auditory cortex and the, and, the, and the motor cortex. That's why when we go to a party or, and there's a, a music which is very rhythmical, we start tapping our feet or we start moving without even realizing because we can trigger uh, activation of the motor cortex just activating or exciting the auditory cortex. So it is really good for motor activities because you put music and then you excite or you activate this auditory cortex, which in turn activates the motor cortex. And so, so there are benefits not only in terms of mobility, but there are benefits also in terms of a cognitive and emotional a state. People that are in that state that cannot play music, when they are able to do something like that, they get emotionally much better and cognitively also much better. They, they do more, more things. Um, we have done this not only for people with cerebral palsy, but we have done this also for stroke rehabilitation. With cerebral palsy, the benefits are limited because this is something from birth normally, and it's very difficult to improve the, the brain connections because it's already a long time since it was injured. But with brain stroke, do you know what brain stroke is? Brain stroke is when there is a lack of blood going into, into the brain for some period of time. For example, a, a vein can get closed. And then if blood doesn't go into the, into the brain, the, the brain dies. The, the cells, the neurons that are fed by this blood die. And normally what happens to those people, they lose half if, if the... If the if the affected part is the left, they will lose the right, the movement of the right hand part, the right, right part. They cannot move the arm or the leg. And if the affected part is the left, is the right, sorry, then the left part would be not, they won't be able to move because it's crossed. This part connects with this one. So we, how can we use this the same way? What we have done is, for example, use this sensor. This is a sensor that captures move position of the arm. And, and speed and and, uh, and and motion, and also the electrical activity. This capture the electrical activity produced by muscles. When I move my hand, there is electrical activity that is, is done by nerves. We can capture this and see how much it is in different parts of the arm. So what we do is we went to we work with some hona, and what we do is um, uh, the these play notes, the, the, and then it's like a playing a game with, and learning to song a song. And then you have to catch the, you have to move the arm in order to catch the, the notes. And also, uh, the first day we went to the hospital, we wanted also to open the hand to catch the balls. We say impossible. The patients can only do one at a time. So what we did was to do both, of also opening. And normally people with stroke can close the hand, but cannot open the hand anymore. So then when the ball comes, they have to catch it. And then they, they train also the opening of the hand. We have, we have done this uh, with a thing. He's looking at, he's looking at this screen where the balls are coming and he's learning to play some. And, and also some people are, you are playing with him. Later, when he gets, he, he can learn the song. He can play without following the ball. The ball's coming down, and he can improvise with the instrument. And at the same time, he's moving. Of course, he's playing music, which is, as I mentioned before, a better way to to rehabilitate. This we have we have we run studies, and people using music, uh, uh, they do much better at recovering than people using just normal physiotherapy that you put balls in a box or you move objects on a table with no music, but they, they, rec they recover much faster and, and, mo and, and, and more than people with physiotherapy. So I, I won't go to the details. The second, the second uh, uh, kind of motor disability is more, is more serious when you cannot control anything. And for that we have done, like we have the device, a, a kind of a piano that you play with the eyes. So there is an eye tracker, Probably you know what an eye tracker is. The eye tracker is something that detects with infrared light where you are looking at the screen and it knows where you are looking. So it's like, imagine like a piano that whenever you look at the key, the key instead of playing with it with the, with the hand, it will be played with by just looking at it. So we have uh, done this kind of piano. These are the keys of the piano. Any ideas why it's circular and not like a piano? 
why we thought it was a good idea to have it in a circular way rather than have it like in a straight line horizontally like like a normal piano any ideas well it's because if you look at the center, if you look you are looking at the center then you don't trigger instru any sound and if you want to play any note it will be at the same distance you have to if if you have it like that if, then some keys will be further away but if you if you go to the center you play a note you go here you always go to the same distance to play the notes if you look at here at this for example this note if you look at here it will sound louder if you look here it will sound softer so you can also control the volume and this has a bit, has been a really successful proje project lots of people use it I will show you a video someone learning to play music with with this instrument we normally try to integrate uh, people with motor disabilities with people without motor disabilities. So for example, this music school in Barcelona, he's a, not a traditional student, he's learning to play the cello, he's a researcher playing the guitar, and the, this child is playing the melody by just looking at the screen. So so, so wherever he looks, he, uh, the, the note will be played, and the other ones are just accompanying the accompaniment. As you see, the, the eye trackers are really accurate because even if he moves the head and still the eye tracker can track where the, he's looking at. So that people with palsy cannot speak and cannot walk. They normally are used to eye tracking technology because for example, this is a child goes to school and he cannot speak, but he sits in a wheelchair with a with eye tracker and a tablet and he looks a lot of letters and by looking at them he will type sentences like what's up what's up and then the, the, the tablet will synthesize the speech so he communicates with the class with the teacher and with the other friends by using eye tracking so so they are used to that but they so they can use that also to learn music we have that, done many projects with people with cerebral palsy in which they we train them to play music and once they have trained to play music, they get together with music students with, from music schools in Barcelona, and they form bands. They form like groups that play together. For example, this is uh, trying to teach them to improvise uh, in, in groups. So, so he's improvising, and someone is playing the guitar from there. Person, you can see, you can see personalities. They cannot speak, so you cannot do. You cannot actually uh, tell about the personality when they play. They actually, you can see a personality because some people play a lot of notes. Some people play only one and very, very conservative. Play very few notes, and they don't want to miss any incorrect notes. So we have done concerts with 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 people playing with bands and, and, and the I harp. And there are a lot of people I say in the world using it from Turkey, who um, has ALS, this illness that you gradually lose motor control, like Stephen Hawking, uh, and, and, and he can just control movement of the head and the eyes. But he was a musician when he was younger and he has complete control Also, uh, you can make more complicated. Or you can play He can play perfectly. He has a lot of videos in YouTube, for example, this like uh, he has. For the disc with the I have, uh, with the instrument we say. You can see, I mean, the, the instrument can, you can produce music which is kind of traditional music with, with, uh, and so if you, anyone wants to, to uh, learn more about the I have, there's a paper, an open, open access paper that we have published about uh, 
talking about it and then also evaluating the instrument. And the last, uh, um, the last uh, uh, kind of disability is extreme motor disability. So for that, uh, people cannot use anything, just the brain. So what we, what we use, I don't know if you have, have are familiar with brain computer interfaces, kind of uh, uh, electroencephalogram device to detect activity in the cortex. And with this, they send to the computer you use artificial intelligence to decode your intention, and then you will the computer will take some action according to your brain activity. So basically, you control the computer with your brain. And for I have students, engineering students, that uh, uh, they do the last, the, pro, the final project with me, and many of them want to do a video game that you control with the brain. They sit down. Um, um, a, spacecraft, a spacecraft or some car that will have to go some, instead of using a control, a gaming controller, you can just use your brain, your thoughts to control that. So we have done that same for music. When we have, for example, you are playing a, a one chord in the guitar, you focus your attention to another chord and the system will detect it from your brain activity and this will change the chord for you. So another way to do that is getting your emotion. So if you have the EEG, you can also decode the emotion state of the person. And uh, we can use this emotion state to change something in the computer. So uh, for example, in this case, the, this is a student that was passing, we put the EEG, which is this thing, this device, and we ask to change the mood of the music. If he gets sad, the music will get sad. If he gets uh, uh, happy, the music will get happy. So so I, I, will, I will give you an... Uh, there's music playing, and he can, with the brain activity, change the motion of the music. He's trying to make it sound. You can see how the song starts to be slower and softer. The second one does better than, than the first one. Uh -huh. Excited a bit. Descansa. Rest, so go back to normal state and then go back to normal, normal original way. So we have you can think of this, imagine you go home and then you can just sit down, listen to music, but the music will follow your emotional state. It's good to do that. Do that. <laughs> so, but that's just entertainment. But what we have done is to use this same technology to try to treat depression in elderly people. In, in depression, probably you know what depression is, but it's, it's a, a low mood and aversion to activity. But the main thing is that when you have depression, is that you have some predominant activity on the right side of your brain to the left side of your brain. So. Normally, if you don't have depression, you have activity like it's changing all the time, and it's kind of symmetrical activity on both sides of the brain. But if you have chronic depression, you will have chronic more activity on the frontal part of the brain than on the left frontal part. So what we try to do is very simple. We encourage music, symmetrical activity in people with, with uh, depression and by listening to music. So, uh, so what we do is something like this. We have the person, we obtain the, the uh, brain activity signal, then we transform this into some emotional state. So we, we, we uh, estimate the emotional state of the person. And with this emotional state of the person, we will then go to a computer system that also has been trained with artificial intelligence to modify the music in different emotions. So this will be transformed into the emotion. The emotion will, will the music sound, the person will listen to the music, reinforce the feeling, and this will be looped that, that, is, that the person is doing. And what we're doing is it will sound happy when the person has symmetrical activity. So um, this, uh, we're trying to make the person try to move to the happy kind of mood, and this will generate happy mood, happy music that will 
reinforce the feeling. And we have done this study with many people and they improve in depression. So after using the system for 10 sessions, what happens is that they retrain their brain. If you are trying to make some activity that is beneficial for you all the time for 10, 10 sessions, what you are doing is rewiring your brain. You are trying, you are actually changing the, the way your brain is connected. So in the future, your brain is more, it's easier for the brain to produce the same activity. So they improve all, they improve in average 17% in, in, in the, in the uh, depression state. And then also they, they really uh, change in, in how positive they felt, how negative they, they felt now extracted from the brain activity, we can calculate this. So, so this we do that. And this also, if you want to learn more about this, there is a paper in, in, a, in a journal talking about the system that changes the music, the system that, that uh, 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 changes the music into, into a happy one, how we compute the emotional state from the EEG and all the details. So the last one I will talk about yeah. and we finish is that uh, we also have tried to use music to improve uh, the social skills of children with autism. I don't know if you know what autism is, but autism is, is a neurological disorder and it's quite common, it's 1% of the population. So it, it's, it's also a spectrum to people that are very much affected and people that are less affected by autism, but there are a lot of people that are affected by autism. And the, what ha the main characteristic of people with autism, they have deficits in empathy. They cannot uh, put themselves in the shoes of the other one. They never understand the feelings of the other person. And also uh, one, one uh, big problem for socializing or for living a normal life is that they have a deficit in processing faces, em emotions in faces. They cannot tell by looking at someone if they are happy, they are sad, they are anger. They don't have a, a clue of the emotions of the other person. For us, it's very simple. It's intuitive. We just, we just can detect how the person feels by looking at the eyes, at their face. And they, but, but uh, for them, it's impossible. And this is very difficult to live in a world in which it's basically using masks, but complete masks. If you are talking to people with complete masks, it's impossible to, it's very difficult to socialize. So, but the good thing is that people autism, with autism are not insensitive or, or impaired in music. Actually, there are many uh, musicians, good musicians that are, have autism. For example, the most famous case is Mozart. Mozart was autis autistic, and, the, and, and he was a, a genius musician. So they are not impaired in the music sensitivity, they are impaired just in the social sensi uh, interactions. So what we want to do, the idea is train emotion recognition in faces in, with, with uh, children with autism, creating a link between music and facial expressions. So what we do is something like, the, well, uh, what, we, what we do is uh, we use EEG again to test what is going on. We use a data set of, images that have uh, uh, people posing in different emotions, happy, sad, uh, angry, and, uh, and fearful, and then in many different uh, other ones, but, but we use only these four. We use music that has the same, like, like sad music, happy music, and so on, and we use the brain activity. We go to the children, and then they, we ask them to, we show them pictures, and we ask them to tell us the emotion they see in the picture. And initially they fail more than half. They, they, are, they don't know what emotions they have because they are, they are bad at this thing. But at the same time, at the same time we capture the, the, the EG just to see what's happening inside. And also we, we decode the emotional state. After that, with different pictures, we do exactly the same. We ask them what is the emotion in the picture, but now we, we at the same time they are listening to music, which is the same emotion. If they look to a sad face, then they they will um, listen to sad music, happy face, happy music, and so on. And then, of course, in this case, they do much better because they have the music uh, input, so they can actually do better. And then, of course, uh, we later again we remove the music to see if there is a, some residual effect. If by having access to the music, when you take out the music, then if they still can recognize better. And it turns out that happens. We do several sessions in which we have music, sorry, no music, music and no music. In each session, they, they started with failing fa uh, most, uh, more than half. They were only getting 
percentage correct answers to the emotions in the faces. And when they finished, they had 71%. And a, and a child with no, autis, no autism, a, nor, uh, a traditional child, will have around 75, 78%. So it's almost the same as a, as a child with no autism. And not only that, probably the most amazing result we got from this study is that because some of them are very clever and they get tricks to recognize emotion. For example, if they see a thief of the person, they assume this person is happy because they must be smiling. So the, if they see a thief, they say it's happy. They remember these tricks to, to distinguish the emotions, but it's not natural to them. So what we did was to see what was happening inside with the EEG, with the, with the uh, uh, brain activity. And this is a very bad picture, but basically at the beginning, the emotional state, internal emotional state was not uh, uh, correlated at all with the stimulus, with the picture that was watching. But at the end of the study, after the sessions, the, the, the internal state of in the uh, emotional state was correlated with the stimuli. When they were watching a, a sad face, they get a bit sad. When they were watching a happy face, they get a bit happy, which is training empathy, not only recognition. And having said that, I think, well, just to summarize, we have used artificial intelligence, we have used uh, um, music, which is the benefits of music, to try to, to improve the health and well-being of people with some, uh, with some uh, medical condition. And also we tried in the kind of sideways to do reduce inequalities because people that have these uh, motor disabilities, they are really outside society, they don't need integrate to society and we try to make them more equal by integrating them into society. So that, that would be my talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Giving applause. Right, we now is the QA session, question and ask answer. And also if here you can raise your hand and also in, in the Zoom, you can also use your future uh, future raise hand. And also, or you can type your question to the chat box. Okay, any question, maybe? Okay. If just use your microphone. Or... Um. All right. So, hi there. My name is Alan Joanna, and I'm from um, Genetics Engineering 2019. So, I got two questions for you. Um, my first question is actually. I just know recently that um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and music are related and they even make music for um, therapy, like hold therapy. And I, I actually just know that. And I think that it is ju just so mesmerizing and excellent concept. So uh, my question is, um, when you use that music which is created by artificial intelligence accompany human made music to enhance the overall sound of the music like can we mix um that that machine learning music like um that i'm sorry that um music with human made music like in general can we mix that in rooms and because i found out that it's going to be um it's going to be amazing to be creating an exciting opportunity for innovative music. And also my second question is, I'm sorry if it is not um, related to music or health. You just mentioned, I'm sorry, you just mentioned that machine, machine learning is in almost a daily basis and can you use machine learning to overcome hoaxes, like hoaxes, hoax, but like fake news information? To, to what? Sorry, to, uh, we use machine learning to, to, to overcome hoaxes, hoax, like fake uh, news or fake uh, information. Uh, yeah, because yeah. I only in this generation, like um, I found a lot of information that are fake, and also I, I don't know, maybe they can't be responsible for. So can you use machine yeah. learning for that? Thank you. Yeah, that, those very nice questions. Thank you very much for your questions. Yeah. The, the first one is uh, about how to integrate uh, automatically. 
and human uh, human music. There have been many people that that uh, have built uh, systems in which, for example, you can play, and the system listen to you, and it will interact with you by composing music in real time. So and and also that could be like a, a way to have a music companion and that could be used the same for therapy because it can be used in different ways. Uh, we have a project in which we want to tackle um, anxiety and depression in, in, and stress in people. And we, we, we have a program where we have a model that generates music and it, it listens to the music you like and it will take patterns from what the music you like and it will compose similar music and it will be like calming music. So then when you listen to this new music, it will be somehow related to what you like because you have already given the music you want, you like. So it will be similar to that, but it will be new. And the characteristic is that it will be very soothing music. So people can listen to that to get relaxed and to get out of stress or anxiety states. And also has been used for a more performance or in the way that I will be playing the guitar and there will be a computer accompanying me and, and we can interact. I can play the computer response, I, I, I play and the response. And this is one of the ways also music therapy works that normally when they, we want to improve some, some interaction, then you can interact with a, with a human. You play and the one plays and you play. And this is kind of a, a, a kind of therapy. So this could be also used in that case. I don't know if that answers the first question. For the, for the, yeah. Um, so does it mean that um, users in general can make therapy music or? The, the, the machine learning created music. Yeah. Coming. I mean, um, the musician in general, like like maybe they, they are a composer or, or they created music so they can also make, um, also make therapy music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean uh, humans or machine or computers? I mean the human. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, humans they, they produce music and they use it for music therapy as well. So, okay. so exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. Cute. And the second one, the second question is: uh, it is really a, a a problem right now to have these systems that can generate a really a credible uh, images and videos that are not real. So there, are, there is, I probably you have heard about deep fakes that uh, you can take a video of someone and then use machine learning to create another video in which the person moves like, like the same person, looks exactly the same, and then you can type what the person can is going to say. So you can have anyone doing almost anything and saying almost anything, but it's fake. And they, for, for example, this famous case, recent case that in the United States, I don't know if you know Bruce Lee, he was an actor, karate actor, Bruce Lee, that was acting long time ago. He was in fighting movies and, and he was a, a karate person, a Chinese person uh, from, uh, and, and then what, what they did, he, he's dead now, he, it was a long time. They, they took the videos of him and they they created another video of him young, like like he was young, mm -hmm. advertising cigarettes in a, in an advertisement on television. He, he was saying, "I like uh, this brand of cigarettes because I I like to smoke." He's dead. He cannot complain, but the family complained because they said this is not what he would have liked to have done. So then there was a dispute, and they had to get rid of the advert. But they can. Uh, what I'm saying is that they can create really realistic. Uh, 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 fakes and this could be hoax as you say or could be anything of uh, and th this is now kind of artificial intelligence is going so fast that the regulations and laws are catching up they are not really regulations that that are in place so they have this case and they try to put a law that will forbid that the copyright will be on the family of Bruce Lee not since Bruce Lee is not alive anymore but if someone uses his image he has asked has to ask for permission to his family and he has to ask and pay money to the family. So that that's in, in many in many ways. For example, in music, I have a colleague who took all the Beatles songs, the, the British band, the Beatles. I don't know, probably you are too young to know who the Beatles are, but the, 
the Beatles is a very famous uh, uh, English band, and they, uh, they, 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 and then put them into a, an algorithm, machine learning, and then created new songs that were very similar to, to the Beatles with the lyrics, new lyrics, new music, but they sound like the Beatles. And he wanted to publish the CD, and they said he couldn't publish the CD because the copyright will be with the Beatles. Because if the algorithm, although he has created new songs, if the data, the, the, the data he's using belongs to someone else, then you have to, uh, to acknowledge the person with the data. So nowadays, that the data is very important, but this was a first also, they didn't know what to do. They said, who's the copyright? I mean, this is new, new songs, but they are based on old songs. Is the, the copyright is the programmer, the copyright is the musician from the old songs, and the, the laws are catching up, trying to avoid these cases, but it's very difficult to, to, to catch all of them. So it's, very, it's a dangerous tool also, artificial intelligence in that sense. As you know, probably elections can be, can, can be manipulated like in the United States, or that, that, that you target the people that are uncertain who to vote. And this, it can be very uh, complicated because this is based on artificial intelligence. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Got it. Thank you for the answer and also question. Okay, next. Is there any question? Ah, okay. Um, okay. Uh, can you hear my voice? Yes. First off, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good evening, Mr. Professor Dr. Ramirez. Uh, it was a very interesting subject because this is the first time I ever heard about artificial intelligence with music. I think it was uh, in my mind. About a couple of days ago, I was watching a Hans Zimmer, Hans Zimmer a composer, music for Dune. He said that there's an ancient uh, music, like a, such an artifact about 2,000 years ago. There's an instrument called a dukuk. A duduk. Uh, yes, an uh, instrument called the duduk. It was a flute. So the instrument was pretty uh, a sharp, soothing, uh, soothing voice. And this is the first uh, thing that came to my mind: is artificial intelligence could mimic this duduk uh, voice that produced. Is there if, if it can uh, mimic the the instrument? Uh, is there any challenge? Like, what's the most challenging things for AI to mimic uh, the older instrument? Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. The, I think artificial intelligence is now able to to mimic instruments, uh, and the, the 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 only need the only thing that they need is data. They need some samples or some 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 data to learn from. So machine learning in general takes some input, which is the, the, the data, for example, recordings of that flute, and it will generate a model that will produce notes in the same style, in the same style. And there are instruments which are easier to, to reproduce uh, and instruments which are more difficult to reproduce because uh, at the end of the day, what you want to reproduce is a signal which is based on many of our fre fundamental frequency signal plus a lot of harmonics, so a lot of signals that put that together. And some instruments have really long sequence of harmonics, but, but um, uh, artificial intelligence has done that. Not only artificial intelligence, but there are all techniques. If you have a synthesizer, for example, uh, piano is easy to, to simulate because the, the signal is simple. Violin is more complicated because it has much more complicated signal. So the violin sounds not don't sound as as as, a, as as real as piano sounds in the computer, and that instrument you mentioned, I don't know, but <laughs> I don't know, I didn't know that instrument. But the, but a, a wind instruments with flutes, they normally are not uh, that difficult either, but it, it can be done perfectly if you have enough data. Then the uh, the, the computers can simulate uh, anything you you feed into them. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the question. Thank you. It was very satisfactory. Thank you for question and also answer. Okay, uh, for info. It's a lot of from outside of ITS University. That is from um, Kalimantan also, and also from other universities in Java. It's quite good to to hear your lecture today. Okay, maybe in online there is a. Is there any question? 
just ask and also raise your hand and mute and just speak maybe okay uh here in offline oh okay madeline this okay thank you for the opportunity to me uh i want to introduce myself first my name is madeline and I am the instrumentation engineering student here. Uh, since I learned about AI in instrumentation engineering, I never heard, uh, hear about the application uh, of AI, AI in music. I usually learn about AI can help industrial process. Uh, but when I joined this guest lecture, such, a, uh, such an amazing experience uh, to hear about this topic and give me more information. Uh, maybe here I just wondering uh, about can you show to us your project that you have done and demonstrate to us you, uh, that you have bring to this this place maybe have you I mean I mean the, I, I was talking about different projects we do in Barcelona but, but, but the, uh, here I, I'm just for a Four days or something like that. So, so I'm not doing really a uh, research project. I'm not working right now in, in here, but uh, but we have lots of projects back in Barcelona. And actually, one of the reasons we come is to make collaborations. So mm -hmm. in the future, we can make projects with the with the university here. Yeah, but okay. Uh, maybe in in some visual like that, you have some project that you can show to us. Uh, that we can uh apa ya yang kita bisa pakai juga gitu saat ini ada enggak Pak? Gimana ya Pak? Yang kita juga bisa pakai gitu loh Pak. Oke. Okay. Uh, maybe... uh, when I saw your prototype you you just build about so many sensor that's a proximity and also uh 